Yo, what up? It's Coach RT3, and we're back for another live with Coach RT3. This week, I've got Monica uh, Rocho, and I hope I'm pronouncing the name correctly. Um, my guest is uh, a fitness instructor and educator, um, founder of Rooted Resistance, and um, we're going to allow my guest to come on and chat about everything from experiences in the LGBTQ community um, to some of the uh, changes and, and efforts being made to um, bring about be a really exciting conversation. Welcome to my kitchen. <laughs> um, my, uh, my wife says uh, we should clean up the, the stuff back there behind me, but I was like, this is episode 15 at this point it's it's a part of the environment so we just we're just gonna have to roll with it um i've had questions about the coffee and all types of stuff back there but you know it's just a part of the atmosphere That's, it's keeping it real exactly I'm keeping, it, keeping real. it real um so i'm glad to have you on on the show um when i was seeking out uh you know people to speak with you came highly recommended from uh my my good friend and I consider uh, elder sister, big sister, uh, Sonia. Um, and uh, I really appreciated, uh, you know, her connecting me uh, with you. Um, so let's just jump right in. And, and um, if you could kind of give us a background of, you know, where you grew up, you know, what your life has been like going from, you know, childhood kind of to now what what brought you to now um your experiences and whatnot and just kind of give us a big you know window into what that that looks like yeah of course so I, I grew up in Connecticut I grew up in a household with my mom my dad and my twin sister um and my family's from Louisiana I wear a, the state of Louisiana a medallion on my on my neck and this is but, you know, gold from my family that we just melted in, just old jewelry. And I, wow. uh, me and my dad have it. I, I think I resemble him a lot. Some of our mannerisms and behaviors are similar. Um, but grew up in Connecticut um, and went to public schools my whole life um, from, you know, preschool to college, all public, public school education. And um, I think something significant in my childhood and that connects to, you know, some of the conversation we'll get into um, is my love for sports and being a part of a team. Uh, and, you know, I, I studied sports management in college um, and I went to college knowing that that was what I wanted to study. And, well, you know, I guess at mm -hmm. first I wanted to study business management. And in college, uh, excuse me, in high school, I did an internship with an insurance company and everyone I knew there was miserable. <laughs> So <laughs> I don't know if I want to do this anymore. <laughs> uh, so I, I searched for schools that had sports management programs, and I also played softball in college. So I knew I wanted to do both of those two things. Uh, mm -hmm. I played at a uh, Division three school, Eastern Connecticut State University. And um, in high school, I was a three-sport athlete, volleyball, softball, and basketball. Um but I'll say even before then, you know, playing T-ball and town sports, I always noticed um, there were never feeder programs for young girls. Uh, you, you know, there were feeder programs for mm -hmm. the boys in my town, especially football. You know, many of my cousins and friends, they played football. Mighty Mites, I mean, four or five-year-olds running around with helmets tackling each other. So there, there wasn't right. a lot of funding for at the time, you know, women are female sports, and I think my identity has evolved, but when there's a male and female sports, I always, you know, I was, I played with girls, so um, something that I learned very on was that there was an equity in sport, and um, I, get, I mean, there's an equity across the board, but an equity in sport, something that I love so much. When I got to mm -hmm. high school, I was a three-sport athlete, but I played softball. You know, we had track, softball, baseball, volleyball. We didn't have lacrosse and field hockey. I didn't know what those things were until college. Uh, those mm -hmm. are more expensive sports. It takes more 
you know, right. play that. So when you think about learning about socioeconomics in sport, that came up for me in high school uh, because I had a different softball coach every year that I played. And I, play, I played for four years. And mm-hmm. um, when you think about team and camaraderie and what that builds within character, trust, reliability, there are all these life lessons in sport that I have learned. Um, but, but because of my life experiences, there, there are some things that are just different. When people come in and out of your life, you're like, mm, I don't know if I trust you. So right. thinking about that in connection with sport, uh, uh, I went to a predominantly black um, Caribbean high school, you know, people of Caribbean descent. And we played a lot of majority white schools in Connecticut. And they had coaches that they had for four years. They had summer league, summer teams that they played on. Their field, their equipment was top notch. So again, this is just a reinforcement of like what our value was and naturally associating that with um, race and socioeconomic status. So there's like this bridge around sport and um, social justice, equality or equity um, and inclusion that I learned at a very young age. And I think that has propelled my life as an educator currently for what mm-hmm. I do and what I'm passionate about. So it's kind of beautiful. It's like a, it's a, a ebb and flow of, dang, that sucks. And well, now I, I have this education and I have my experiences where I can share it. And I also know that it's not a, my experience isn't a coincidence. There are other people who have very similar experiences um, from their childhood. And especially with sport. I mean, I think it brings up a, a, big question around access around sport and um, Mm -hmm. particularly for female sports or women's sports, um, you know, around coaches, um, the longevity of coaches, female coaches within, within different sports games, sports teams. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, we've, I mean, we're in the era of, of like kind of, I guess the aftermath of title nine or, or kind of, you know, we're still working our way through all of that, I think, or, or still growing. I guess the aftermath of from some of that. Um, uh, when you, so through high school uh, and then going into college, did that, did that kind of change or did you continue to play sports in college? Um, yeah. That, so, yes, I played softball for my freshman and sophomore year in college. But the interesting thing is, you know how some in your high school, your coaches make videos of you to send to colleges? Mm-hmm. My high school wasn't equipped to do that. So actually, one of our rivals in West Hartford, Connecticut, Connor, Coach Lytos, their softball team is the person that was like, come to our facility and I'm going to make your videos for you to send to colleges. And that, it was mm-hmm. the goodness of his heart. And to this day, him and I are still in touch because I was just so thankful for that. And and I mean, I sent I sent my tapes all over. I was like, I'm playing softball in college. Going <laughs> <I sent laughs> to Fresno State. I was like, I'm just sending them. I just felt so good. It was an empowering thing that a coach was willing to do that for me, and a coach of one of our rival teams, you know, literally down right. the street from our town. But it was because he knew that I was talented. He felt that I was deserving of at least giving myself the shot. So. I right. played my sophomore, my freshman and sophomore year, and I struggled on the softball team in college, um, and it was mainly because of the racism that I experienced. I just, I, I had to decide, one, I wasn't going to the Olympics. It, it, I think by that time, Olympics was out, of, the softball was out of the Olympics. I loved, this, mm-hmm. I loved playing sports. Many people think I'm competitive, but I'm really not. I, <laughs> I'm competitive with myself, but not other people. Um, I just love yeah. being a part of a team. And I, I lost that, that passion in college just shifted it. I, I became a resident assistant in college and that's where I really started. I, I had the platform and access to students to do more events that focused around inclusion. So mm-hmm. I played intramurals my junior and sophomore, uh, my junior and senior year and I no longer was on our varsity softball team or collegiate softball team. And I, I mean, I, I was okay with my decision. It was a hard decision to make, but me and my coach had a good relationship. Um, and I, I think she was disappointed, but I also think she understood where I was coming from. Mm-hmm. What kind of, um, 
like experiences? I mean, you said you mentioned that, you know, you ended up not playing anymore because of experiences with racism. Like, was that from teammates or was that from, I mean, you said you have a good relationship with your coach. Mm -hmm. uh, was that like teammates or opposing teams? How, where was that? I'm so glad you from? asked that question because it was my teammates. <laughs> and I think, I mean, looking back, whether it was unconscious or not, it didn't matter. It still impacted me. And I will never forget my coach. One day we were in, I can't remember if we were in Florida or Arizona because we traveled during spring break. And something happened where one of my white teammates said something to me. And I, it was like my tipping point. And I just broke down. And I remember telling my coach. And she benched that player for the games that we had that day. So when I say we had a close relationship, I knew she respected me. And I knew she didn't have all the answers when it came to, like, you know, I don't really know how to have this conversation. But that action showed me and showed our team that that behavior wasn't okay. So, mm -hmm. um, and I'll also say, when I think about the intersections of identity, I am a trans masculine person. I mean, and that has evolved. My gender identity has evolved. So I came out as gay when I was 15, freshman in high school. Got mm -hmm. to college. I never talked about my sexuality. People just assumed that I was gay. And, and that assumption was right. Um, and sometimes assumptions are right, but it's dangerous to assume. But um, so, in, and on the softball team, there were other people, there were people who identified as gay, people who identified as lesbians. Um, and my coach, my coach was one of those people, but we never talked about it. So it's like, I think that's another thing in sport that, you know, when we talk about the LGBT community in sport and just inclusion around female coaches, it's this unspoken thing. I mean, it's unspoken in general, but typically yeah. if a male comes out as gay, I mean, ESPN is all over it. If a woman comes right. out as gay, it's like, oh, she plays a sport. She must be gay. It's, a, it's a, an assumption that is dangerous for the world and dangerous for sport. And, you know, it, it just, again, differentiates male, female. So I, I say all that to talk about the intersections of identity because I could level with my coach and really relate around our experiences around sexuality. And she was a mas she's a masculine presenting person, but she identifies a, as a lesbian. Um, but when it came to race, there was less conversation. Um, and that doesn't mean that I don't know that she wasn't open to it. I just know that she she didn't feel like she maybe was equipped or didn't know how to move about that conversation. But when she, so when right. she talked about diversity and inclusion, it was the umbrella using those words and not specific, you know, race, socioeconomic status. Um, so, I mean, that action is the one thing that I really remember from college and it it, mm -hmm. it made me respect her more because there are other coaches who would have just ignored it or been like, stop being a baby, suck it up. But um, right. I will say in my life and through sport, I <laughs> white people, ironically, I mean, when I think about softball in high school, I remember Bloomfield High playing Northwest Catholic School. I don't know that they're a rival, but they're a Catholic school, so we wanted to go hard. It's like, oh, we're, you know, private school, public school. And one of my, my one of my town friends played for that team. We played softball growing up all together, uh, our whole lives. But she mm -hmm. went to private school, and there was a coach in the audience who came up to me after the game and said, "Do you play summer ball?" And I said, "No, my parents can't afford it." Connecticut uh -huh. Eliminators was the team. That team asked me to play for them that summer, and I said, "I will play if you allow my sister to play." We're twins, so I'm like, "Where I go, she goes." <laughs> right. They allowed both of us on the team. And they bought our uniforms, they bought our helmets, they paid for us to travel to regionals, and I had never experienced anything like that before. And it, it, it right. again opened my eyes to, these people are giving us access to something we didn't have. And ironically, it's based off of a physical talent. They, you know, they're like, you all are good, we want you on our team. So there's kind of this, I don't know if it's a dichotomy or if it's just this layered experience that I've had in sport where I don't believe my high school coaches didn't want to give us that experience. I don't know that they mm -hmm. had the funding. I don't know that some of them may have not had the skill. Um, right. But we were really privileged enough to have that opportunity where someone saw us 
and then gave us access to those things that my teammates back home didn't have. Right. Yeah. That's, that's pretty amazing. I think, I think a lot of us, you know, I always, I always talk to people about um, opportunities because, you know, I think there's, you know, there's this notion from a lot of people generally doesn't come from, from people of color, but this whole notion of, you know, pulling yourself up by the bootstraps. And I'm just like, no, actually, you know, there's different degrees and levels of privilege and opportunity. And, you know, if, even when you think you didn't get a handout at some point in your life, you got some sort of like opportunity or somebody gave you something that helped you get somewhere. I mean, you can work as hard as you possibly want, you know, like we, we all work hard. Right. But if that, opportunity doesn't land if that opportunity doesn't hit then you know you're just going to be keep keep working until something like that does happen um yeah. i wanted to i wanted to jump back to um a couple of things you said earlier uh particularly um well the first thing was just about male versus female in sports mm -hmm. and the uh i guess the the commonality or the it's very common for females to come out and present themselves as gay or lesbian or whatnot but within male sports it's just it's not there right like it's just it doesn't happen um and you know i i'm a firm believer i refuse to believe that you have all that number of of human beings in one place <laughs> <laughs> and, and and that there's not you know one two three four however many you know there's got to be some percentage right um so what do you think i mean this is just i mean this is just your opinion right like what what do you think makes it um i guess more acceptable uh for 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 a female community or more acceptable uh you know in one aspect versus versus the other yeah i think i think that's definitely on because you you know if we're talking about privilege i think that's definitely on a cultural and systemic level that 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 is acceptable and it, it's in a way i think that's absolutely attached to patriarchy <laughs> i mean it, that's the the big answer because it's it's like women can be fed aside. Like, you know, it's like when, when people talk about generally, when people talk about lesbians or women who are gay or whatever the case may be, and we can even talk about transgender women in a sense, um, they just become, hmm, they become the subject for someone else. It's almost like that woman isn't a human being, so um, uh, it's not that big of a deal. But um, but it is. I mean, it, this is someone's life and this is someone's identity. So it's like it's viewed as sexy, you know. It's viewed as um, something that is for a man's appeal. When it's like mm -hmm. again, this is someone's life. This is a part of their identity, and. Um, when I think about men, uh, men who might be a part of the LGB, yes, people in the comments are saying because women become objectified and sexualized. Absolutely. That is, that is absolutely true. Um, and that, that is culturally acceptable in the United States and globally. Mm -hmm. Um, and for men, it's like, you gotta be macho, this machismo attitude, like, and, and being gay or being, being gay is associated with being feminine, a trait that all of us right. have, a characteristic that all of us have. We just, right. um, we perform it differently, what, regardless of our gender, um, you know, regardless of where you might be on the spectrum of gender. So I, I really think it, it hurts. It hurts people. It hurts relationships. It hurts sport. It's, um, it's very detrimental to sport. And I think I see it a lot when, I mean, I've read plenty of articles around uh, female coaches, women coaching in, in sport in general. And there are women who are a part of the LGBT community 
who leave coaching. I mean, we will lose, we will lose women who are, are girls who are ter turning into women. We will lose them in the sports industry because of they don't want to be, they don't want their life to be mirrored in that way. Like, you know, media attention in a way that is like, yeah, okay, I'm a lesbian or yeah, I'm trans and I'm a coach and I'm good at what I do and I want respect just like anyone else would want it. So right. I think it's a nuanced answer, but I, I do think that it, I think it really hurts the sports industry and, and the fitness and wellness industry as well. Yeah, I, I can agree with that. I think it, it definitely, these, these thought processes, like you said, with ego, um, you know, and, and this hyper masculinity um, seems to be something that, I mean, I believe it's something that's very detrimental because, you know, hyper masculine, hyper masculinism, if that's even a word, it um, it is. Well, you know, it, <laughs> see, it seems to, it seems to be something that it, it actually drives, um, uh, I, I think it drives people into this space of over competitiveness to some degree in some aspects, right? Um, like on the field, fine, whatever. But, you know, when we're talking about, for example, lifting weights or, or, or doing certain things, it's like this, this whole idea of go hard or go home, no pain, no gain, like all these things are, are wrapped into that, that sort of um, mindset. And, and even so much so that I think our first conversation was just after someone had commented mm -hmm. on my post, who does Brazilian Jiu Jitsu he comments talking about you know, you don't understand our, our warrior mentality because, you know, what do you think we sit around and talk about our feelings during, during our, our rest periods? And, and in my head, I'm like, well, you know, I mean, there's, that's a pretty cool thing to talk about. Like, during <laughs> rest period. Right. I mean, you, I mean, my clients do that quite a bit during their rest periods, Absolutely. you know, like, Mine too. and, um, and, and, and sometimes, you know, it, it's, it's funny because like, you know, sometimes you, you're dealing with people and there's a lot of emotion attached to um, exercise at times. I mean, I have clients who, who have in the middle of training with me have decided to tell me a story about their childhood, yeah. you know, and, and how they felt, you know, bullied for being overweight or how no one understood, you know, about their issues dealing with weight and, and things like that. So, you know, there's a lot attached to, you know, exercise and movement. There you know? is. And I mean, I've watched some of your videos on mobility, which I love because that's always the area that I can grow in. But I think about what you just shared and how much we hold in our bodies and our shoulders and our hips, you know, and our hands and um, how we have to release that or, it's healthy to find a way to release it if you find value in that. And some of those things are connected to trauma from childhood for, you know, yeah. So, yeah. I, when I think about movement and working out, it's a part of healing. It's a part of releasing. So yeah, I've had clients and I shared this with you before break down crying in the middle of an exercise because, and they tell me, don't come near me. I'm going to finish this exercise. I just need to get this out. And then we, Right. We can talk about it later, and we also don't have to. But, yeah, I I think warrior mentality and no pain, no gain, I'm like, if if you're actually in pain, you probably should stop. <laughs> There's a difference between, <laughs> you know, like really pushing and being in actual pain. I don't want you to get hurt. <laughs> right. So, yeah, I think it's a mentality, and it's learned behavior. All of it is absolutely learned behavior, and it's learned from – the very young ages of socialization and right. it's just, it's a detriment. It's a detriment. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it, it, it does more to separate, you know, us than, than bring, bring people together. You know, there's, it's like, you can't, it, it's, I, I, I mean, I'm assuming, I mean, because I haven't had this experience, right? Like I'm assuming that, you know, if I look back, I mean, I, I look back and I reflect on, on high school and, you know, the people who I, 
who I went to school with and played football with. And, um, you know, I didn't find out until uh, we were adults that um, as one of the guys, he didn't play football with us, but he, he was on the baseball team. Um, you know, he came out as, as gay. And so that didn't happen in high school. But I mean, that if he was dealing with that in high school, that must have been hard. I just think back to that. I'm like, that must have been really hard for him to, to be in that space and to be trying to be something that he deep down inside felt that he, he wasn't, you know? Um, And so trying to be an athlete and trying to, you know, grapple with that, you know, must have been a, a real challenge for him. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when I was a resident assistant in college, I had, I was the RA for some of my teammates, which was kind of cool. Um, and there were several of them who eventually came out to me, and then they came out to the team. But it, they were, they were less, they weren't struggling as much as coming out to the team as they were coming out to their families. And mm-hmm. you know, I'm thinking about your teammate that that is a lot to carry. It's almost like you feel you're, you just want to live your life, but you feel like you have to hold space for all these, you know, different things because you don't want to disappoint people. You don't want to let people down because our parents, our families, our friends, they have these images of what our lives will be. Um, And, and sometimes, you know, it's hurtful for them. In some ways they grieve what they wanted our life to be. Um, and we try and teach them that it doesn't, our sexuality doesn't mean that our life will be any less or um, less greater than it would have been, you know, the way that they envisioned it. But yeah, mm-hmm. it, it's a struggle and it, it is something, I mean, just imagine keeping one of the most important pieces of yourself from the people you love. That's, you know, right. it's, that is a very tough thing to do. And that's why, you know, finding community and a foundation, a strong foundation before you actually feel like you you're ready to to come out um the other thing i wanted to ask about uh and and go back to was uh particularly about the coach and the coach not being able to um like look at you know the race issue Hmm. um but at the same time having that common ground of of feeling i mean it's like on the one hand you are in the same boat because you share this this common sexual sexuality uh that's you know kind of separates you from other people in a way because people see see it as you know from through their own lenses but then like do you find that you know the inability there's an inability for um like non let's see lgbtq non people of color mm-hmm. to deal with racism white people right like so <laughs> right so i mean it's it's like you are you are a part of an oppressed segment of of society mm-hmm. but at the same time you cannot see the oppression of you know someone who's like you in this way but not like you in that way yeah. right and I mean, Kimberly Crenshaw, I mean, is the queen of intersectionality. And I mean, what you bring up is a, is such an important point. And I'll be 100% honest, there are LGBTQ movements, particularly in sport, that I have removed myself from because it's a bunch of gay white men who are, who are the leaderboard of it. And I'm like, that's not the LGBT community that represents me or that I know exists. So there's this, I mean, going back to my coach, yeah, we had this kind of experience that we could relate on and then another experience that we couldn't, which is still unfortunate because white whiteness is a thing and white people oftentimes don't acknowledge their whiteness as a race, like being white (laughs) in our society is a a privilege. It's an unearned privilege. And um, yeah, it's, it's, Across the board, in trainings that I've done, Rich, from high school age, so 15 years old, to being in trainings with 65-year-olds, particularly around race, the story is the same thing. White people retreat when race comes up. They get defensive. They reflect. And that's whether they're a part of the LGBT community or not. And I think 
I I genuinely believe that race and racism like is the biggest social issue that we that like if we don't address race, I don't know how we can address the LGBT community. Anything yeah, else. We can talk about right. the LGBT community without talking about race. And even within right. the trans community, there are white trans people, particularly white white trans men, that are propelled, that are, you know, getting opportunities, that are making money in a different way than the like my kindred of queer and gender non uh, binary non conforming people. Um, people of color are in the community doing this work, grassroots work, and they are not getting the same leverage that that white person is who's a part of the community. And I, I that's a problem. You know what I mean? Right. And I'll say, even in college, for me, so this is kind of a pattern in my life, from college or now to even college, I have felt distant from the LGBT community. And now as an adult, I have been able to create that for me. So I I feel like I have a very powerful community that I'm a part of now. But in college, I was like, I don't want to be a part of that group. It was very, it highlighted whiteness so much. And I think so many LGBTQ spaces do, again, not recognizing that white people aren't only the LGBT community that, that exists. There are people of color. There are black people. They, we are here, and many of us are doing a lot of work in the fitness industry. I see um, Tommy Morell right. who just joined, a, a great guy in Miami. We still haven't met, but he's also a personal trainer um, and a phenomenal trainer at that. So we're here. <laughs> right, right. And that's that's important to, to note, you know, that's important to note. And, you know, I think the other thing, you know, because the, one of the reasons why I started this, this show um, was to highly highlight, like I said, highlight um, voices that a lot of voices that don't get heard, um, but also kind of establish um, an, an understanding that um, there are highly qualified, highly skilled educators mm -hmm. of color in the fitness community. And Oftentimes we are overlooked, you know, for counterparts that that don't necessarily um, carry the same amount of, uh, of not, not I don't want to say ability, but qualifications, right? Like you're underqualified for for the role, and you're propelled to a position of uh, and stamped with an approval of of quality. Oftentimes when um, that's not always the truth. Mm -hmm. um, so with all that said, what is uh, your company, uh, Rooted Resistance? What is that all about? Uh, Rooted Resistance, that's my little baby. That, that organization is connected to everything that I talked about from playing childhood sports. And it's also, so I'll just break it down. The rooted piece comes from this idea of knowing where I'm from, but not knowing where I'm from. So this idea of mm. being connected to my ancestors, um, you know, I knew my grandmother, I knew my great aunt, and a lot was lost in, when they yeah. passed away. So the Creole language that they knew was lost. It wasn't, it wasn't transferred down. My, my parents can understand it, but they never taught it to my sister and I and my brother and my other sister. So it makes me think about where is home? I know it's, right. I know it's not on this. I know it's not the U.S. But um, right. so it's a reminder to myself to stay rooted. And that's my tagline, stay rooted. And I knew I wanted resistance in the title because that's connected to education that's connected to different forms of demonstration and protest but it's also connected to um what we talked about earlier feeling you know when you're working out you're physically resisting and you're not for me mm -hmm. it's not only a physical resistance it's a mental and psychological resistance building up your mental capacity to be extremely strong so mm -hmm. i i said i have to i want to merge these two things together um, and I focused it around really training trans masculine people. So there's this idea of 
you know, um, you know, some people don't, they're not in the bodies that they want and you can transform mm -hmm. your body and feeling empowered to do that and having an affirming space to do that. Sometimes it's not LA fitness. It's not a commercial gym. Um, right. It's training outside where you have a sense of privacy in a park with just you and your trainer or another small group of people um, that identify as you that have a similar story to you. And I wanted to create that type of environment. So that's what I did with Root mm -hmm. Resistance. Um, and I started it in 2016. And I just started putting myself out there on Instagram and Facebook and connecting with other folks in the LGBT community, particularly the trans masculine community in Tampa. And mm -hmm. it's, it's been phenomenal. Social media has been such a way to connect me to community, um, to people outside of the country. Um, to people across the country like you. Um, so it's really focused and centered on centering our experiences, creating an affirming and empowering space and body positive space, you know? Um, and particularly for trans masculine people, a lot of people want to build up their upper body, build up their chest. Um, so just giving exercises, um, exercise programs that will enhance those parts of their bodies. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's like most of the people I worked with have been trans men. So I, I can relate to them and they can relate to me. And it, it's been, I think it's been a beautiful thing. It's, it's, it's surely been a way to connect with the community um, and build a safe space. That's pretty awesome. That's pretty awesome. Um, so that's, that's the one project. Um, you had a plethora of, of projects you worked on. Um, and things you did um, leading up to that. Um, I don't have the whole list here, but uh, let's see, what was it? There was something with, with Nike? Yeah, if I'm not, the if I'm not... LGBT Sports Coalition. Mm -hmm. um, gosh, I don't remember if that was in 2012 or 13, 2013 or 14. Mm -hmm. But so Nike headquarters is out in Oregon and they did a youth summit, a LGBT youth summit. They had schools from all over um, come to the Nike headquarters. And I was a part of one of the I was a part of the panel. Um, mm -hmm. Three of my other friends were on that panel who were all athletes at one point in their life. And that was cool because we got to talk to you. Um, and right. that, so the first time I ever was involved with anything associated with Nike was just their conference. So I went to it and then the next year they invited me to the summit, which was really neat because I'm still connected with some of those high school students who oh, that's pretty it's awesome. so cool, who are part of their high school gay straight alliances or they, some of them called it spectrum. And, and I love that piece because I'll say in 2000, 12 and 13 is when I really started being on different panels specific to uh, LGBT sports inclusion, inclusion in sport. And I did that at, in Massachusetts at, when I worked at UMass Amherst. And the cool thing about it is I found my voice doing that. I'm really a shy person and I don't like public attention. And it was a challenge putting myself out there. It was like I wrote my story. I started drawing out my socialization like how was I socialized as a young girl and mm -hmm. now not identifying in that way but like just thinking about my life story and how I was socialized and how my parents if I wanted to play in the sandbox when I was 15 still then I did that if I wanted trucks they never questioned me if I wanted to ride my bike outside <laughs> all hours of the night they never questioned me it was well, I had to be home by 8 o'clock, so let me not put my parents out there. Like that. <laughs> when the street lights turn off, you got to be home. But yeah. they, never, they never questioned why I didn't want to play with this or why I did want to play with that. So I felt like I could be who right. I was as a child. So I mapped out my socialization, and I just started writing my story. So being on panels became almost second nature. It's like just how you and I are having a conversation. And... Um, I kind of felt like I came into myself more. So that was my experience with Nike. It was a great experience. I met some wonderful people. And something else significant that I think one of the things I'll always remember is being on the NCAA Inclusion Forum last year, actually last April. 
um, in Rhode Island. And I was on the panel with three other people who worked in co who work in collegiate athletics. They're administrators. Mm -hmm. And my full-time job is in residence life. And this position has given me an avenue and access to student athletes on campus. So I got to talk about the work that I've done with our athletic department around inclusion and diversity, um, particularly around LGBT sports inclusion. So that was a really cool mm -hmm. experience. And again, it's in a room full of collegiate athletes athletic administrators so it's passing along our stories uh because they likely will run into students who have similar stories or have a connection point and if they are educators they should be knowledgeable about this you know yeah absolutely um how did you um so with uh your sports management background um i mean what what's your what's your end goal like as far as like i mean root of resistance is one project i'm assuming you've got you know some big projects on on deck as well yeah there's there's always so much up here but <laughs> i have um i want to grow root of resistance in the sense of um so me and two of my buddies have or three of them have made a collective and it's called kinetic collective so it's Mm -hmm. um, it's four of us and we all live in the Southeast. So I'm in Florida. One of them is in Georgia now and two of them are in North Carolina. So we're, we're trying to, or not trying, we are creating this collective and we are marketing ourselves as educators, personal trainers. And one of, um, Nori is really into sustainability, sustainable living and horror culture. So it's like, we're trying to connect all of this in the sense of holistic wellness, particularly for the LGBT community. Um, mm -hmm. So that's a that's another project, kind of an umbrella project to root of resistance. I think what I have coming is I'm going to be leaving my full time job and I'm going to be going to pursue my doctorate degree in sports management with the focus on cultural studies. So I really want to study the sociology of sport and focus on and gender mm -hmm. in sport. Um, and kind of resistance and activism and how it's shown up in society um, globally. Um, and does that really propel us to do it? Like, does that propel our consciousness? Does it expand our consciousness? And if it does, which communities is it expanding? And how is it changing the system? How is it changing us culturally? So that. That's mm -hmm. the big thing that I have coming up. Um, and I'll be working in the sports management department at Florida State. So I'll, I'll be moving north uh, from Tampa. Oh, nice. And still, um, nice. I, basically, I'm going to be trying to find a new community for rooted resistance in Tallahassee um, and doing what I can to be of a resource for the LGBT community that's out there. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. Um, that's one area that we, we share common ground because I – I did my master's in sports management. Right. Um, wish I had, uh, wish I had uh, the patience, <laughs> <laughs> fun funding, patience, all that sort of stuff to uh, uh, pursue uh, further education, because um, that's definitely um, something I've pondered, you know, a lot, you know, especially especially that I've gotten older and and find learning to be a lot easier. You know, like it's it's funny because like when you when you're young, like the stress of of learning was was grade related, mm -hmm. and and then you get older and you're like, you know, I don't really care so much about the grades. If I pass the class, I pass the <laughs> class. But I'm I'm here to learn. Like I'm here to get information and take that information, process it, and use it for what I want to use it for. I don't care really about what the school wants or anything <laughs> like I just want to use this stuff for mm -hmm. me right um so um just one more question I think or two more questions I think we can we can probably get through um what what are some of the challenges uh you think are are being faced like within the fitness community mm -hmm. um you know for the LGBTQ community, like how, how, and there was a couple of other uh, uh, 
letters that I know I sent a message to you, like, I don't know those letters, <laughs> please explain. Um, <laughs> so um, I think it's important that, that people understand, you know, what each of the letters stand for and why there's, you know, needs to be differentiation as well. Absolutely. I think I'm thinking back to that message. I think we had the I for intersex, the P for pansexual, the A for asexual. There's other letters that we could add that we see for them. <laughs> There's everybody, everybody exists. Every letter in the That's alphabet can be right, used. We... <laughs> we all exist. So I think some of the challenges, the things that really come to mind when I think about visibility and accessibility, like are, are members of the LGBT community, and for the sake of our conversation, I'm gonna say queer community, queer and trans communities, do we see ourselves at a commercial gym? No, I, I mean, I, don't, I haven't even been in a commercial gym in so long, I don't even, but no, I would say no. Um, but when I think about accessibility, I'm talking money, I'm talking transportation. I, especially mm -hmm. I'm thinking about the Southeast. I grew up in New England. Being in Florida, I mean, public transportation is, it's terrible. I mean, and <laughs> it is absolutely terrible. It's, it's, there are people who make things work. If they don't have a vehicle, they, they know how to get around. But, and I think, you know, with mm -hmm. Ubers and Lyfts and whatnot, I don't want to say it's easier because that costs money too. But so yeah. accessibility, I think is tough. There's, there's someone that I know who lives an hour and a half away from me and I train him, but we don't get together that often in person. You know what I mean? It's like, so think about <laughs> accessibility and access. I think those are some barriers and some challenges. And I don't think it's anything that we don't do our best to overcome, but I definitely know it's a challenge. Um, mm -hmm. And I do know, and I'm one of these, those people included, um, there are queer and trans trainers who, who put their prices on a, on a scale, depending on who it is. You know what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. And I, I think that that's for the community. And that's oftentimes why we don't make money. We're not, some of us, I don't want to speak for other people, but I know for myself, it's not about making money. Um, it's about this message and giving someone access to something that will help them be more well. Um, right. But I do, I, I do think that we also value our time and our service. So there has to be a balance mm -hmm. to it. And then, right. aside from the accessibility, affordability, and visibility, um, I think somebody respecting your body as much as you. So if you're training a trans person or if you're just training anyone, I've been, I mean, when I got my certification, the person who did my certification, I mean, he said a lot of things that I'm like, I wouldn't train with you. And I mean, to me, even you don't touch a client without asking them permission, regardless of their gender. There's just certain things that I think are acceptable that aren't like if my body is mine. My client's body is theirs. I should ask permission, even if, you know, if I want to shift their hips or whatever. Can I? All right. So th I think there's little things that we can learn, but I do think that some people are resistant to that. So specifically around trans people, some people wear binders when they train. And I think, um, you know, a binder is, it's compressing their chest. So talking to your client about how sometimes that is a dangerous thing to do um, because you're restricting your airways. Um, damn, I keep, I keep dropping the phone. Um, but, you know, if, that, if that's what makes them feel comfortable, if that what is what makes them feel like they are themselves, um, then you have to be creative in some of the exercises that you're giving them, making sure that they're breathing correctly, but, you know, kind of honoring that, not, say, oh, you know, you shouldn't wear that. You know, thinking about how right. you're speaking to folks, um, I think is really important. And I, Rich, I really think it's about mindset and education. Like, I, I know that I wouldn't be paying, I wouldn't pay a trainer who I felt didn't respect who I was or who wasn't. Mm -hmm who I didn't even feel comfortable with sharing, like I'm a trans masculine person or, you know, I, I couldn't imagine some of my clients not feeling comfortable to share the depths of what they've shared with me. Cause that's a lot right. to, that's a lot to conceal while you're working out <laughs> or just client, yeah. you know, if you have to conceal it for most of your life, you should at least have at least one space where you can let it all out. 
Right. I, I, I agree with that a hundred percent. I mean, I think it, it kind of works both ways, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you, are you comfortable with your trainer or is your trainer comfortable with you? Like bo both directions and, and, you know, like, I think I couldn't service somebody who didn't like me or didn't respect, you know, me. So, um, and that would probably be quite clear um, and evident by some of their behavior or their conversation, right? But at the same time, I, I already know that they wouldn't select me in the first place. So mm -hmm. due to their in, inherent and, and sometimes unconscious bias. Absolutely. Right, like vast majority of my clients that work with me, um, they're biased towards me. They're not biased the other direction. Yeah. So my clients, you know, are, you know, activists. My clients are people who work in, some of them work in social justice to some yeah. degree. Um, I mean, you know, even if it's on the higher levels of social justice, um, and it's, it's really weird how that all kind of shakes out to some degree, um, with the people I, I end up, you know, attracting or keeping, you know, um, so it's, they, they tend to have, um, like put it this way, you, you couldn't, you couldn't be racist and, and train with me right <laughs> it's just because i'm gonna walk in with a black lives matter <laughs> shirt on and you're gonna be like and you're immediately gonna be like well i feel some kind of way about mm -hmm. that and then you and if you feel some kind of way about that that you can't have a conversation um then one of us is the problem and it's not me yes so <laughs> See, i think that's powerful because and i like how you said it does go both ways because like, you know, that relationship is not going to work out. That trainer, coach, client relationship is not going to work out. And with someone, it might. Someone might, that might bring up a great conversation. But with others, it might not. I mean, it was, it was funny. I had, a, I had one uh, lady walk in and train with me, and she was from... I want to say Iowa, very sweet lady, or she was, I don't think she's from Iowa, but she's living in Iowa. Um, and, you know, I was uncertain, but she chose me to come and train with in the first place. Um, and was also given a recommendation to train with me. And so the first session was cool. She's cool people, you know, we're training. Second session, she comes in and she's got this shirt on with the pink pussy cat on it. And I was like, Oh. And so, and so I was like, all right. So the next day I was like, well, I'm wearing my Black Lives Matter shirt. And then she immediately starts like having conversation about, you know, social issues and about what's going on where she's at. And I was like, okay. So she was communicating mm -hmm. via, you know, via what she was wearing to the gym. Um, and so it's people make, like I said, people will gravitate towards the people that they feel, um, fit mm -hmm. and it'll work, it'll work out. I, um, what was the last question I had for you? Um, how do you think, how do you think that, uh, things are changing within the, the industry with regards to accommodation. And so how do you think things are changing and how would you like to see, or what more would you like to see change? Mm -hmm. I don't know, I'm not in the commercial industry and I don't know that much is changing there. Um, mm -hmm. But I will say, I think that social media has really propelled um, trainers within, I guess, trainers in some ways who are just creating their own paths, who are creating the environment mm -hmm. that they want. And, and um, I know that in my personal experience, social media has definitely done that. Um, I think that the fitness industry, the wellness industry is attracting more educators. And I think that that's a huge change. And educators in the sense, educators 
that aren't just talking about physical wellness, you know, that aren't just correcting your need to be behind your toes when you're doing a lunge, that are talking about social issues that, that you, like how you, the example you just shared, that are talking about, um, you know, what's happening in their counties with their school systems or um, the level of police brutality that is happening around um, the country. I think so I, I see that because that is the community that I'm around. That's the community that I've been connecting to. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that is the, that, like, it goes back to we're out here <laughs> and in little pockets um, and in waves and trying to do things collectively. Um, and I think with social media, like we're on Facebook Live right now, that's another example of access. Uh, yes, yeah, you're missing yeah. some people. And if you have access to the internet, you have access to information that you wouldn't have if you didn't. Um, and, right. And it's these type of chats, these type of dialogues. So opposite to what the warrior comment was, I think these type of dialogues is what further um, pushes the, the industry in a progressive way um, because it's rethinking, it's reimagining. It's My friend's company is called Decolonizing Fitness. It's decolonizing this image of this one size fits all fin- fitness industry you come in you sign up for a month or monthly payments and nobody cares about you they're just collecting your money so it, right. it is creating this caring empowering affirming um responsible and trustworthy community and i think i think bit by bit we're just we're doing it we are we are not we're not going to allow we're not going to allow anything to interfere with creating it yeah, that's pretty, I mean, I definitely can agree with that. Like, social media has opened it up, you know, for everybody to do what they want. I, I made the comment the other day, you know, nobody invited me to a podcast ever. Mm-hmm. So I decided to start creating my own chats, you know. Like, you know, for all the people who, who get pulled on to podcasts just because, mm-hmm. you know, just because somebody knows somebody or somebody feel like, oh, their buddy should be on their podcast. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a bunch of, you know, bros, yes. you know, pretty much um, out there having very, I mean, some, I mean, there's some good podcasts out there, don't get me wrong. But, you know, a lot of stuff out there is just like, really. Mm-hmm. And I, I think I like the, I like the, the idea of decolonized fitness, because I talk about this a lot within, within my communities, which is the, which is the idea that um, this Eurocentric view of how fitness should be, should be applied uh, across the board to everybody, you know, to Asian people in Asia, you should be doing it this way to, to African people in Africa, you should be doing it this way to black people in America, you should be doing it this way. You know, the whole, uh, idea of, a quote unquote, paleolithic diet or, or things like that. I'm like, I don't know about you, but in Ghana, they, they eat cassava. (laughs) You know, I mean, I don't know about you, but in Thailand, they eat mangoes and rice and, you know, that's how people Mm -hmm. live. So don't come telling me that we're supposed to eat this paleolithic, you know, type diet, which is based on, you know, a Euro idea and concept of, of food sources. You know, food sources that aren't available in, in you know, uh, what do you call it, equatorial countries. Yeah. It, I mean, absolutely. I, it's, it's what you just said is such a great point. And it's, it's real. It, I mean, I, I would say the same just about body types and who is a trainer? What physique do you have to have to be a trainer? There is right. no one physique <laughs> at all. I mean at all so it's yeah all of that is so connected and it's it's we're just pushing all that aside we're just creating our own (laughs) yeah yeah i like it i think i think it's all going in a great direction and i really you know i think with people like yourself pushing the envelope and and taking it to the doctorate level (laughs) um, take it and 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 take it and push it even further which is going to be great um I really hope to to stay connected and and you know 
do some more stuff and, and find and keep abreast of what you're doing and, and see how it evolves. Um, really appreciate having you on uh, here today. And it was a really great conversation, really insightful. Um, and anything else you want to say before uh, we no, go? I, I no, Rich, I want to thank you and um, our friend Sonia. Thank you for connecting us. I see that she's on. Um, but no, thank you for having me on. And thank you for what you're doing out in California. I, I definitely want to stay connected. And when I'm, whenever I get out there, I'll make sure that you know about it. Oh, for sure, for sure. And uh, let everybody know how they can find you on, on social media, YouTube, Facebook, uh, Instagram. Yeah, so on Facebook, um, you can connect on my Ruta Resistance page. That is called Ruta Resistance. And Instagram is the same tag, Ruta Resistance. Um, and um, someone's, I, I see people typing in. And on Twitter, I'm Rooted underscore Resistance. I don't use it that much, but I'm on there sometimes. But you can you can catch me on Facebook or Instagram. And my I know you, I don't you don't use it that much either. I don't use Twitter that much. I mean, I got into I got to the party late in the first place, and now I hear Twitter's not even really the place to be <laughs> unless you're trying to unless you're trying to you know uh, you know say something foul and retort to the president or or something like that. But. Um, yeah, other than that, I don't even know what the real point of Twitter is anymore. <laughs> no, I'm That's... with you on that. I, I'm one of my, I see one of my biggest supporters, Neldi, shouting out and telling people to go check out my Ruta Resistance apparel. I do have, I do have a new line coming out this summer, so be on the out, be on the lookout for that. Oh, I gotta get a yeah, shirt. I, I send gotta you get a shirt. shirt. We'll, I will touch base yeah. on your size and one. I'll send you some stuff. Nice, nice. All right. Well, it was great chatting with you. Thank you so much for, for taking the time out of your evening to uh, chat and um, really appreciate it. And we'll talk again cool. soon. Take care, Rich. All right. You take Bye -bye. care. Bye.